S. Deng Wu Sami, Professor Guo, Professor Cai, and uh, our distinguished speaker, participant of APCG. Uh, welcome to the third day of our program. Uh, uh, my name is Xue Zichen, and uh, currently the Dean College of Education, National Taiwan Normal University. It's my great honor and the real privilege to uh, serve as the moderator of this uh, keynote speech. Uh, today's uh, uh, keynote speech session seven, we are very happy to invite Professor Joseph Lensuri uh, to share his uh, recent uh, uh, work uh, about uh, uh, his uh, impersonal program. Uh, his uh, keynote speech entitled Assessment for Learning, the Missing Element for Identify High Potential in low-income and minority groups. Uh, before his uh, 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 speech, uh, I would like to give you a very brief introduction of uh, Professor Ren Su Li. Uh, Professor Ren Su Li uh, is a leader and a pioneer in gifted education and applying the pedagogy of gifted education teaching strategy to all students. The American Psychology Association named him among the 25 most influential psychologists in the world. He received the Harold uh, W. Michael Gore Junior Award for Innovation in Education, considered by many of to be the Nobel for the educator, and was the consultant to the White House Task Force on Education of Gift and Talent. Uh, today, uh, he will show uh, as with his uh, most uh, recent work, an online personalized learning program that provides profiles of each student's academic strengths and uh, interests, learning style, and prefer more of expression. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, please join me with your big hand to welcome Professor Le uh, 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 in order, in order to avoid the in internet commission uh, problem, we have uh, Professor Lin Suli has pre-recorded his video. So please uh, uh, play the video. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today and to share with you uh, some of the new work that I've been dealing with for the past couple of years. Um, the work is really summarized in this diagram where we see a set of scales and um, the scales really uh, talk about two kinds of learning, assessment of learning, that's the stuff that really dominates so much of what goes on in education, achievement tests, uh, math, especially math and uh, reading, and what I call uh, assessment for learning. Now, I think assessment of learning has its value, but I would like to see more balance between these two types of learning, which I will be describing in detail as we move out, move throughout our uh, session today. Uh, it really focuses on uh, promoting uh, more enjoyment, engagement, and enthusiasm for learning, what we call the three E's, and is actually the theme of our center at the University of Connecticut. And it's designed to uh, promote a, a more enjoyable and a more creative culture in the entire school. And we do this by combining uh, new work with previous work, which you'll be seeing in a couple of minutes. And uh, these th three things really relate to the major learning theory that I've developed called the enrichment triad model. And then uh, using that model to infuse enrichment throughout the entire school, the school-wide enrichment model. And these two things have also resulted in an online program because doing the kind of teaching that we advocate requires a lot of resources for teachers. And unless these resources can be found quickly and easily, we'll still be using a basically a, a one-size-fits-all uh, approach to teaching. 
Now, uh, this is a diagram that I begin almost all presentations with. Uh, as we all know, but sometimes don't think a lot about, all learning exists on a continuum that ranges from deductive, didactic, and prescriptive learning on the left to inductive, investigative, and inquiry learning on the right. And again, in the lower part of that box, you see JIT, which stands for just-in-time just content. That's content that may not be in lesson plans or unit, unit plans or even the textbook, but it's information that children learn how to go and get when they meet it, need it to deal with a particular problem. The focus of my work has been on the right-hand side of this, and uh, people have oftentimes asked me, what's the goal of gifted education? And I always say to increase the world's reservoir of creative and productive people, innovators, designers, entrepreneurs, people who make a difference in the world. And so I'm not arguing against the value of assessment of learning or even the fact that we have to learn our states and capitals and times tables. But the fact is that learning to apply these kinds of things in a more investigative and creative way is really what the, my work in the enrichment triad model is all about. Uh, in order to understand this, you need a, an understanding of the difference between formative and summative assessment. Think of summative assessment as a test at any given uh, unit of instruction. We want to find out how much kids know. And formative assessment is information that we find out that helps us to act upon some of the kinds of things that we will do with young people. Uh, I like the quotation at the end by Hattie and Pimperlary. Formative assessment with appropriate feedback is the most powerful motivator in the enhancement of achievement. And so we're trying to get more formative assessment we're also trying to get more what I call performance-based assessment, gathering information about what students can do and might like to do, you know, or what we insist through a prescribed curriculum that they have to do. Uh, and uh, I sometimes refer to this as the pursuit of real problems. And you're going to see some examples of what I call real problems as we move along. So um, I, I always like to begin uh, with this quotation by Donald Campbell. I've used it many, many times. Uh, it's better to have imprecise answers to the right questions than precise answers to the wrong questions. And we can't measure some of the kinds of things I'll be talking about as precisely as we can give a percentile of a child's third grade math score. But nevertheless, they become very important. And so again, the idea is developing over the last couple of years, and that's what I'll be talking about today. I'd like to start with four important questions that we all need to ask ourselves as we go into any process of change. Change ain't easy, and so we have to know where we stand if we want to get to someplace different. Uh, the uh, first question is, what is the biggest challenging challenge facing the fields of gifted education. I don't think there's any argument about the answer to that, and that is the underrepresentation of low income and minority groups. And I will add to that with equal importance, kids that may not make it by a given cutoff score, but have something going for them that we can uncover by looking at their assessment for learning rather than assessment of learning. And these are just some news, news articles that have appeared over the last couple of years uh, where there's lots and lots of talk about underrepresentation. I've actually got five pages of these slides of just newspaper reports. You'll see a few more as we move along, as in the next slide. Question number two, what are the possible outcomes if we don't find effective ways of addressing this challenge? And here we see things like, for example, New York sweeping suit over NYC school bias calls for disband of gifted and talented programs and uh, an article from Champaign, Illinois district to propose phasing out elementary level gifted programs. So our pro 
programs are really in, in some danger because we can't solve the underrepresentation problem. Here's some good news that I picked up in one of my blogs. Uh, the St. Louis Park School District would extend gifted and talented programming to all students. And this is what we will uh, discuss uh, as we move through uh, the school-wide enrichment model. Um, question number three, what needs to be added to universal screening and local norms to make a difference? People that are talking about uh, underrepresentation are saying, well, let's use universal screening, which by the way, we do in most states. Almost all kids take state achievement tests. Um, and uh, that's a good thing. Uh, the, prob the problem is we're only screening for a certain segment of a child's potential. So advocates who recommend universal screening and the use of local norms continue to depend on cognitive ability and standardized achievement tests to make uh, to, to identify youngsters and make necessary adjustments. Uh, there are many exogenous factors uh, in underrepresented populations that are the reason that these young people simply do not do well on these tests. And down at the bottom here, we see a list of exogenous uh, factors, parental care, nutrition, early childhood experiences, uh, poor schools, all of those kinds of things really lead to uh, what again, are called exogenous factors. So if we don't look for other kinds of things than what we already know they're not going to do well on, we're not going to be able to move ahead. Question number four, and this is an important one, and I've written a couple of articles on that. Uh, I'll give you my uh, LinkedIn account at the end of this if you want to search for any of these. How do we use the G word as a noun or as an adjective? As a noun, it's, it's the entity position, and there's no, no synonyms for their, uh, uh, the G word uh, in uh, the dictionary for as a noun, uh, other than one might guess things like blessed or preordained, uh, but they, they don't really cover uh, the idea that some kids are gifted and are and always will be, and some are not and never will be. The de developmental position, which I've written a good deal about, I use the word as an adjective. I don't talk about the gifted. I talk about gifted education programs and services. So you see it there as an adjective and synonyms frequently found when it's used as an adjective are superior mathematician, advanced reader, innovative designer, exceptional artist, etc. And so, I'm trying to also uh, change the culture a little bit as, the, as to the way we use the word. Uh, this next slide is based on something that I developed in 1978 called the three ring conception of giftedness. Uh, I must say that it was not greeted with a red carpet when it first came out. As a matter of fact, uh, all of the gifted education journals rejected it and I finally had it published in a general ed journal. And I say today with no amount of modesty that it's the most widely cited article in the field. And what this theory talks about is the interaction between and among three sets of traits that lead to what I call gifted behaviors. Again, notice the word there uh, is being used as an adjective. One person after my article was published even wrote an article called Rinzuli-itis, a national disease in gifted education. So I'm very happy that this article uh, has done well over the years because it means the field is changing its mind in a, a little bit of a way. We've already talked about formative and summative assessment and the difference between the two. So I'm going to skip this slide and move on to what uh, this approach is all about. The uh, difference between of learning, basically scoring well on traditional tests, and assessment for learning is looking at things like enjoyment of learning, interests, learning styles, executive functions, collaboration, cooperation, all of those kinds of things 
that I believe are important in the repertoire of young people, especially in today's rapidly changing world where high level executive positions in almost every field is looking for these kinds of things just as much as they are looking for students uh, grade point averages and rank in class when they graduate from college. I also talk in my work about two types of assessment. One is called status information, and that's anything you could put down on paper before you even meet a child. You, you know his or her scores, his or her teacher ratings, things like that. Action information are things that you can only document when they are happening or after they happened. So we're trying to identify strength-based characteristics that will facilitate future learning. Again, you saw them in the previous slide, creativity, motivation, learning styles, et cetera. And uh, one time I was asked, how do we measure action information? One of the things that we've included in our wor work is a thing called the action information form. And it looks like this. Uh, these are ordinarily sent from one teacher to another or sometimes an outside mentor or resource person. And to give you an example, I'm a big four example kind of guy. Stephen G is driving me up the wall. His new idea is to produce a solar car. He has already drawn 10 plans and collected research about solar energy that is extremely advanced. So when the resource teacher in the, our school-wide enrichment program received this, she invited this uh, young person in to work with her, even though he wasn't a officially identified gifted student. And she also got him many, many resources, including some adult mentors. And he eventually further developed his car and actually entered in the state science competition. So again, uh, a summary into practice, a sample of, uh, of learning instruments that we've developed over the years and, so, and you see the light bulb there, teachers fill them out, and even kids and parents can fill them out for that matter. But we're looking for the kinds of things that students complete as uh, sources of input. And uh, we've developed many, many instruments in these areas. To me, having an idea isn't worth a dime unless you can get it into practice. So over the years, uh, my colleagues and I have developed uh, interest. Uh, interest assessment. You'll see some examples of this in a minute. Learning styles assessment, uh, expression styles. Tell me how a young person likes to express herself or himself, and I can do something great with that young person person by working backwards from there. He likes or she likes to draw cartoons. All right, let's get him some how-to books on cartooning. Let's see if a local cartoonist might want to work with this young person. Uh, so let's look at a few examples of these questions. Uh, this is just from our, our interest Eliza. Pretend your class is going on a field trip and you are in charge of picking the places to go. Check off three items from below. Museum, sports game, music concert, uh, firehouse, mayor's office, TV studio. And it goes on, on and on like that. Um, we have a, a primary edition of this. Um, We've also developed a separate uh, interest Eliza just in the area. Let's ask children what kind of books they like to read. And then instead of always using the primer, let's let them make some choices. Uh, the, uh, this, is, this next one is a little bit more graphic with some figures on it. This is one for primary age students. Uh, these are some questions from our learning styles and inventory. We ask youngsters, do they like to participate in a game that tests their knowledge and material they've learned? Do they like to share ideas with other students during a class discussion, uh, talk with other students about a topic of interest? And uh, the uh, most recent in that series is an instrument that uh, asks questions about expression styles. Uh, we gave it the name My Way after the Frank Sinatra song, I'd like to do it my way. And uh, here, all of these instruments have gone through a, a, a rigorous research project. There you see some of the data that gives us the factors that the, are, are analyzed by the instrument. So here are, are uh, just a few examples from the uh, a, a, a very recent instrument uh, called the Executive, 
executive function scale. I think that we've uh, retitled it all about me. It's still going through a research project. And this scale is based on a organizational piece that I developed after a, a couple of years of research, looking at all of the major categories and sub factors that people are looking at when they study executive functions. Again, which have become much more important even in college admission. That's what uh, people that read admissions letters are looking for. Has the person done a community uh, resource project or have they helped out at a uh, senior citizens center? Have they written anything uh, to, uh, to express a particular point of view? Um, six things you can do with assessment for learning. First of all, create a strength-based profile or portfolio for all students. Second is modify the role of teachers from the stage on the stage, the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. Form an enrichment cluster program. I'll be going over these things individually as we move along. Gain access to how-to books for teaching authentic investigative skills and teach young people the investigative and data gathering process. You'll have copies of these slides. Uh, I'll send them out to your or, uh, conference organizer. Now, this could be a uh, paper and pencil uh, portfolio, although I must say that it does result in a lot of paperwork. And that's where a new program that uh, we have uh, developed uh, called the Renzulli Learning System, an electronic technology-based program, which you'll be hearing more about, comes in. Uh, I know what you're thinking. Give me a break. How can we accommodate all these things? I've got 26 kids in the Ministry of Education and a curriculum to cover. And there you see the teacher hiding under the desk. Well, let's take an example from people who have been very successful, like Google and Microsoft and Amazon. Do you know that almost every couple of days I get a personal letter from Amazon? Hello, Dr. Joseph Renzulli. Now, how do they know what to send me of the billions of products that are out in the world? Very simple. They have my profile. They know what I have purchased in the past. And so they will send me like-minded like books or furniture or food or whatever I, I choose to buy. Now, one of the things is that, again, gathering this information in paper and pencil format is very time consuming. And so we did develop this program, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. It's called the Renzulli, Pro, Renzulli Learning System. And what this does is it has youngsters answer a series of these questions about interest, learning styles, etc. And these are analyzed by a computer and they, the result is that they produce a student profile. This is one for Valerie, a sixth grade girl. And uh, this is how we overcome the paperwork problem in this process. And so the analysis of this by the computer points out Valerie's three strongest interest areas, her three best learning styles, and the three ways in which she would like to express herself. But let's let Valerie tell you about this herself. I sometimes think that when kids tell the story, it's always better. Valerie Stickles, and I'm a sixth grade student. I am one of the people who tried out this from Zuli Learning website and it was a really great website. We, I got my profile back and I am one who loves poetry and I just, I really love poetry and it, on my profile it actually said that I loved poetry and so whenever I went on to my critical thinking or books it was going to be all about poetry. On some poetry websites they actually let me submit my work to um, contests and everything and I got to, I haven't heard back from them yet because it's supposed to take a few weeks but I can't wait to hear back and so I'll hear back from my own email address. And I'm going to stop it at that point because of time but just to tell you a little bit about Valerie, that was when she was in sixth grade. By the time she graduated from high school, she had uh, about a dozen poems in local and uh, national uh, magazines, some for children's poetry. 
Uh, she went on to become a teacher at, of poetry, and uh, we still stay in communication. And when I ask her about, you know, why did you go in this direction, she traces it right back to some of the projects that she did when she was using this program. So here's how the instrument works. There's a tool for personalizing uh, curriculum instruction called the Strengthalyzer, where we look at the items you see on the left and we're adding new items, the executive function scale. As soon as we finish the research, that will be going in there. We're actually putting in a school climate inventory and even the school happiness scales. Happy kids learn better than unhappy kids. Um, this is where the real beauty of this system comes in. The computer reads this profile and then it scans through a list of 50,000 highly carefully selected enrichment resources, no worksheets online or text online, and it picks resources just for Valerie. And I believe that um, this use of technology is the only way that we can break loose from the, the one size fits all curriculum or the common core state standards that have dominated uh, so much of our education system. So if you go to the website, www.renzulilearning.com. You'll find uh, all kinds of examples. You can try it out. And by the way, I did not name the program. It was developed with uh, $10 million of investment capital by the University of Connecticut. And then when it was all done, uh, they uh, uh, paid Sally and me a nice royalty and it moved on to a private company. So uh, again, here's just some examples of some of the kinds of things. Now, this next slide, again, is a theory into practice slide. And what we've done is use the three ring conception of giftedness and the enrichment triad model to build into uh, the Renzulli learning system. Dozens of these are just a few examples of type one activities, uh, type two activities and type three activities. And so again, theory doesn't have value to me unless you can put it into something practical. So I move on to the, the next uh, uh, issue, and that is modifying the role of the teacher. There are two very different roles uh, for teachers. We all know the role of the teacher as an information giver, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I believe that if you're going to use this pedagogy, the enrichment triad type of pedagogy, then one of the things we've got to do is at least have part of the teacher's time in the role of guide on the side. And a great deal has been written about this, but I want to tell you one story about it. It's always easy for me to work with teachers of the gifted, but uh, in the school-wide enrichment model, we're trying to work with the general population. You know, I walk into a room of 150 uh, middle grade and high school teachers and say, we, we want to change what you're doing. They look at me like I came from some other other planet or galaxy. So I developed this activity and I'm not going to do it with you today, but you're, self, you're welcome to use it if you would like. I put up these things on the, uh, on the screen uh, and I asked the teachers to raise their hand if they've ever been part of anything related to sports, to science, math, technology, written, oral, visual, performing arts, or extracurricular activities. And I asked them to put their hand up as I put each of these three, uh, four slides up on the screen. And when they're done, I say, wow, man, you guys, some of you had your hand up two or three times. And in your role as the, the soccer coach or in, in your role as the uh, faculty advisor to the school newspaper, you're being more on the guy as the guide on the side. I then ask them three questions. What I'm trying to get is they already have these activities. They're just not allowed to use them in a prescriptive curriculum. And the questions are who came? And they always say, well, kids that were interested in soccer versus kids that were interested in chorus. What did they do? Not what did they learn? They always presented something, they performed something, they wrote something, they did some service activity. Then the real payoff question, what role did you play? That is you, the teacher. And these are things that I compiled. I've done this with many, many groups. So over the years, I compiled a list of the most frequent answers. 
And here you see on the screen, I'm just going to put them all up. Librarian, taxi driver, press agent, general consultant, advisor, shoulder to cry on, fixer. I asked the teacher what that meant. And she said something like a lawyer, you know, that we, we want to use the copy machine in the office, but Madame Defarge, the school secretary, will cut your arm off at the elbow. So we bring her donuts and we schmooze with her a little bit. And the next thing you know, we can use the copy machine. So I've got a lot of great stories as I question teachers on uh, their responses to some of these questions. And what I'm trying to get across to these teachers that are not gifted, talented, card-carrying specialists, but regular general classroom teachers is they've got these skills by all of the show of hands. And you're certainly welcome to use that if you want to try to uh, turn around a faculty. Um, now, um, uh, item number three uh, from that should be, uh, I'm sorry, form an enrichment cluster program in your school. What we found in uh, developing school-wide enrichment models in schools is this is a good starting point because it gives the teachers a chance to where this brand of learning is on the front burner. The first rule of, of the enrichment clusters is there are no lesson or unit plans. There are startup activities, mainly type one enrichment. Bring in a speaker, show a video, take a field trip, have a discussion. Uh, they come together during regularly scheduled time blocks to pursue, again, a product, performance, publication, presentation, some form of artwork or community service. And so you'll then go and get, this is where just-in-time information comes in, you'll go and get the kinds of tools and resources that you need. And these are the kinds of things, again, that we tried to build into Renzuli Learning. This is where the interest lies are becomes a very valuable item. Uh, start with two or three exciting tech one, type ones that show up professionals in a particular area you do. And there you see a list, Disney Channel, Discovery, again, visiting speakers, field trips. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Uh, next, uh, brainstorm three formats that the final product might take. For example, will it be something constructed, published, presented, displayed, or some kind of social action. I love this uh, cartoon. These aren't just any old doodles, Ms. James. They're, they're notes for my graphic novel. Uh, that's where instruct in, uh, expression styles comes in. And again, here we see a, a breakout of the many, many different ways uh, that people express themselves. Uh, the next one is really uh, something my family accuses of being in greater love with than I am with them, but they're, they're first. And that is what we call how-to books. When we talk about giving young people the investigative skills to investigate a topic, there are literally hundreds of these books. We have a whole separate database on the how-to books in Renzuli Learning. One of my very favorites in all the world is the Student's Guide to Social Action that you see there, where it teaches kids how to do uh, community projects and social action projects. Uh, just an example, make movies, start a business, build bridges, write stories. It goes on and on. And so um, at, at my uh, lab at the University of Connecticut, I have a whole separate section section of our library that is just how to do books. I'm sort of obsessive about collecting them myself. Um, there's, believe it or not, there's even a how-to book on how to write how-to books. Um, look for places, this is the product outlet audience goal, look for places where student work can be published, presented, displayed, and brainstorm. Uh, where would you like to send this? Do you want to send it to a, a your, your science project to a local newspaper or the state science contest? And so, Kids like to start thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional, even if it's at a more junior age, let's say, than an adult scientist or a filmmaker from Hollywood. They're doing what the big guys do at a more junior level. And this is where all those kinds of skills that we talk so much about in gifted education come in. Now, the next one uh, is for... Um, a guide on the side, after a few cluster meetings, teachers should never be talking to the whole group more than a third of the time. Their role should be 
advising, giving feedback, suggesting uh, human resources, print digital resources, and thank goodness for the internet because so many more resources are easily available uh, to young people today. We move on to the uh, item number four, promote in enrichment infusion into the regular curriculum for more personalized learning. And I must tell you that this has been my biggest challenge. Uh, working with gifted teachers is a pushover compared to working with a general faculty that already feels overwhelmed by regulations and prescriptions. So I've developed an activity and um, the activity is called an, an curricular infusion activity. And I use this thing, this little uh, uh, baker's thing. I always ask the question, uh, how do bakers get the jelly in the jelly donut? And that's uh, sort of my metaphor for infusion. And what we've developed is a thing called the creative idea generator. And it works like this. And these are examples from schools I've actually worked with. I asked a group of teachers, uh, what were the two most, um, these are uh, middle grade teachers, uh, what were the two most memory oriented things uh, that they teach? And they came up with a list, but the, the highest on the list were US states and capitals and multiplication tables. Then they were divided up into groups and I asked them to try to think of ways that they could make those two topics more interesting. And here, um, and I, I know you can't see the small print here, but in 10 minutes, they came up with 22 different ideas. And um, they sent me some of them over the next uh, several months. Uh, this is a state that they have to sing the state song uh, at once a month at an assembly. And they hate that song worse than the devil, the devil hates holy water. So they actually came up with a rap song and they sent me a, a tape uh, that, that was the rap song that the kids came up with. They also, uh, a group of kids invented a matching game where they would give a, a, an item of importance from a given state. Like for example, where was the Frisbee invented? And you draw a line from Frisbee to one of the, I think that there are uh, uh, 10 states on the five forms of this matching. And the kids had so much time because guess what? They were re researching these states, by the way, the Frisbee was invented in Connecticut. Uh, so uh, here again uh, is uh, one that a teacher sent me uh, that she uses for uh, brainstorming historical topics. And she uses, are they interested in the people, the period, the events, the places, or any other thing? Uh, one, uh, one group of kids was interested in fashion, women's fashion during the Civil War. So that's uh, they were actually able to fill in that bubble. So uh, this is uh, a, a bulletin board that uh, one teacher sent me as well and allowed me to use as an example. Uh, the historian, she got the uh, information from a how-to book called The Historian as Detective. And there you see uh, some of the kinds of things that real life historians actually do uh, in their work. Uh, here's one from science and it's a, a how-to book on earthworms and it's questions raised by students about organisms and here we see many many different kinds of questions that kids can uh, do if they're interested in, in uh, scientific research if they can do uh, individual uh, research on. Uh, and here's one uh, making nonfiction from scratch and uh, that's the table of contents of the book. And it teaches kids just how it's written by people, with a lot of experience in nonfiction. And so um, these are the kinds of things, sample problems focusing on questions uh, for students interested in earthworms. And uh, uh, that slides slightly out of order. It should be back following that other one. How does light affect earthworms? How does moisture affect earthworms? Are earthworms sensitive to touch? And these were all things that kids learned some investigative techniques. Now these next slides, and I could show you 30 of these, but these are again, all of the areas, some of the areas in which there are how-to books, a student's guide to conducting social science research, uh, how to make scientific projects 
science project, scientific, um, easy, uh, easy design, plays for young puppeteers, how to make pop-up books. The list just goes on and on. Again, here we see the social action book, the kids' business book. You're going to hear about um, in, a, in a later example. The next item in um, enrichment clusters, and again, the pedagogy that we're trying to get into the classroom is teaching young people the investigative process. And uh, in my lab uh, at UConn, the University of Connecticut, we have all these bins that you see on the lower left. And in each bin, there's an instrument. The instruments are listed at the upper right. And what we try to do is teach teachers how to use the instrument with young people. And then when they're all done, they ask a question. Now that you know how to use this instrument, what are some things that you might like to investigate? Uh, by the way, two of my colleagues and I uh, did a, a book on this that's available from Proofrock Press. I'm not trying to sell books, but if you want to teach kids about these instruments, we have all kinds of great activities. So let's take a look at an example. This is a bacteria test beater. And what you do is you put some uh, powder on your hands. First, everybody has to wash their hands to make sure they're all the same degree of cleanliness. What does that mean? The same water, the same temperature, the same amount of soap. So everybody's hands is that's the same. Then they go out and they touch different things. And then they use this to get a reading of what kinds of uh, bacteria or germs are on their hands. So when the teacher taught the young people how to use this, this is, this is excellent, this is an actual example. They decided they would like to go out on the playground and touch commonly used things to see uh, the amount of bacteria. So these are some of the pictures that the teacher sent me. Uh, they're touching the handle on the overhead rail, the uh, railing on the playscape and the seat of the slide. So conclusion, uh, I love this quotation. and I don't know who it's from, but if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we always got. <laughs> And uh, thank you for that kind of pause. Uh, it's more comp. It, it is more complicated. Is it more complicated than simply drawing lines between cutoff scores? The answer is absolutely yes. Will it take more time? Yes, unless you use the technology-based version. And. Will it help us identify more young people with high levels of talent potential? And the answer to that is yes. And our research over the years has really shown this. We've had some kids, as you're going to see in the next couple of examples, that are remarkable. Uh, this next example is a school that I work with in New London, Connecticut. It's an old seaport town, and uh, it's about 80 80%, 85% African-American and Hispanic. And they started an enrichment cluster uh, called Night of the Notables. And uh, the it was completely the teacher's idea. And she wrote up a nice little description. What famous people are you interested in? Why are you interested in them, etc. cetera? And uh, this is a little boy named Kenyon who's play, uh, portraying Guillaume Bluford the first African-American astronaut. And what each person did was they gave a two-minute presentation. They went to other schools. They did a parents' night. They even did the Board of Education, which, by the way, yielded a lot of results for supporting their enrichment program. And then they went to their stations, and you could go to their station and ask questions because they had to study that person, anticipate the most frequently asked questions, and then they would uh, actually portray that role. So here is the uh, kids. This was over two separate, uh, the, the, this cluster was done twice. And so the first row and the second row are, there might be a little bit of overlap, but uh, these were the, the kids, the p famous people that the kids uh, chose and they did marvelous research. They read biographies autobiographies in some cases. They looked at some things uh, on the internet about the lives of these people. And uh, you see all kinds of people there. 
uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, Roberto Clemente, uh, Guillaume Buford, you saw the astronaut, Helen Keller, Anne Frank, it goes on and on. And if you ever went and visited that uh, night of the notables, you would see so much excitement. Now, this next one is a very special story because I got to know this little boy. His name is Ethan. And Ethan was an average kind of kid. He was, you know, middle percentiles in whatever test he took. But he had a very strong interest in building things and construction. And so um, we had a, a person come and introduce all of the students in the school about a thing that we started in Connecticut, believe it or not, 40 years ago called Connecticut Invention Convention. And uh, they uh, now it's going national and even a few other countries are developing them. But I want you to listen to Ethan with me for a minute and then I'll tell you his story, what happened as a result of all of this. Hi, my name is Ethan. I'm in second grade at the Southeast Elementary School in Manfield, Connecticut. And this is an invention that I made. It's called the Flashy Novel. And the problem my invention is false is we don't always know where my dog needs where we are. So this is an easier way to tell. It's by a wing electrically attached to a light bulb. And when war is inside the bowl, um, in school, the light bulb is on. And when the there's no water in the and it's empty. The light bulb is on, so it will tell you. And I think this is a really good um, crash, um invention because people are so busy, they'll get their attention because the light stands out and you can see it from another room. After your house is dark, the light will shine when the bowl's empty, so you're instantly not, your dog needs more water. And the change in you along the way, is even though it's called the flashing novel, it it doesn't flash because I was afraid that if I made it flash, then it would scare your pet and then your pet wouldn't want to drink out of it. And and more than half of the people in the United States are pet owners. So it's a, so it's a really good invention for pets. And this is my first prototype. We have cardboard and the bowl and the light bulb. And they're and over time, um, cardboard can get wet and soggy, and if it became wet and soggy, it, it would become flimsy and wouldn't be strong material anymore. So my second prototype that I made was wood. Wood is stronger, but still over time it can wrap. So um, it is better material, but it can wrap. If this was sold in stores, it would be made of plastic. And plastic is um, stronger than, um, well, it doesn't do, it doesn't wrap, it doesn't get flimsy, it does get wet when the dog grips on it, but otherwise it's totally good. So, um, I'm going to take the bar out now, and as you see, the light bulb is off. Now, if I took the water bottles out, the water out, the light bulb comes in, and now I'm going to replace it with the, act, the actual liquid. And it only takes a little bit of liquid to turn off the um, light bulb. Thank you for considering my project. Okay, well, one of the things I'd like to mention is, again, Ethan's a very a average child when it comes to his state achievement test scores and his teachers say you know he's not he uh, not the sharpest kid uh, but um, he entered this into the Connecticut uh, state invention convention and he won first place and as a result he went to the national finals which are held at the uh, Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn Michigan now this is where a little nudging on my part comes in he, uh, I said to the principal, does the, anybody about to know this, that he won this, that he went to the national conventions? And so she contacted the Hartford Current, which is our state's leading newspaper, and they wrote a nice little article uh, about uh, Ethan. 
And uh, the one of the local news stations, I don't know if it was CBS or NBC, read the article and they came out and did an interview with Ethan and basically the school got a lot of recognition because they were doing these kinds of things. This is not the only example uh, to come from that school. Another great example that, again, we got good publicity on was uh, one of the children in the school uh, died from cancer, and a group of children got together, and they designed and built a garden that is five years ago. It's still there today that is dedicated to this child. They even came back when they were in high school to take care of the gardens. And one of the things we fail to do in gifted education is to be our own best press agents and our own best uh, pe uh, persons that promote public, public, public relations. And I think that one of the things that we can do to get more teachers interested in this and get more policymakers like boards of education and administrators that may say, no, I've got the, the, the gun at my head is the state achievements test. We can get some good publicity on this. Now, I want to go back to Ethan for a minute because there's a poem that a teacher sent me uh, after I told the Ethan story. And the author is unknown, but I dearly love this poem. I don't cause teachers trouble. My grades have been okay. I listen in my classroom and I'm in school every day. My teachers think I'm average. My parents think so too. I wish I didn't know that because there's lots I'd like to do. I'd like to build a rocket. I have a book that tells you how or start a stamp collection. Well, no use in trying now because since I found I'm average, I'm just smart enough, you see, to know there's nothing special that I should expect of me. I am part of the majority, the hump part of the bell, who spends his life unnoticed in an average kind of hell. How many kids come home when their parents say, how was school today or what did you do in school today? They say, boring. We don't have to change the entire school or the entire required curriculum. But we've got to build in some things that create examples like you saw with Valerie's poetry and like you saw with Ethan's um, dog bowl experiment. Now, to summarize this, we built a lot of our work into a thing which we call the school-wide enrichment model. And the model has three service delivery com uh, components. The first one, and really the one I've talked about the most today, is comprehensive strength assessment. And by that, I mean taking a greater look at assessment for learning rather than just assessment of learning. The second is a process for your traditionally high achievers. It's called curriculum compacting. And uh, it's a technique that we developed that asks teachers to raise certain questions at the beginning of a unit of study for young people that may already know that information and then not make them sit there while they're going over stuff they already know, but we replace it with more interesting things. Some of the examples that you were, that you've seen were when kids left the regular classroom uh, because their curriculum was compacted, uh, our own daughter being one of them. Uh, the third, again, is the enrichment triad model. And there's a lot written about that, but it's just really three interacting types of enrichment. When I say interacting, if you do a type one with students, let's say on uh, the effects of acid rain, uh, then you ask at the end, who would like to do more on this topic, or you have a speaker in, or they say a video or something on the internet, then that's where the type two thinking skills, creativity, problem solving, all of those things come in. But the third part is really the payoff for um, triad is individual and small group investigations of real problems. A young person or group picks a problem that they would like to do a research project on, do a publication, a performance, a presentation. And this is where the teacher's role as guide on the side is to help them find 
all of the kinds of resources that they might need. Um, I, I, my off-the-cuff definition I've already mentioned for uh, type 3 enrichment is the young person thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional, even if they're doing it at a more junior level than an adult professional. And so, um, and this also is what makes school more fun. Uh, you see the goal of our work very simply summarized. Enjoyment, anything you enjoy doing, you work harder at, you play around with, it leads to more engagement. And engagement is kind of hard to define, but I always like to use this as an example. The first time you fell in love with someone or something and how your whole chemistry changed and you were a different person because you were to thoroughly engage in a, another person or some work that you do. Uh, I'm a bread baker. I even have a school a certificate from the uh, King Arthur Baking School to prove it. And I love to bake, mainly bread. And I'm, once I get a formula or a recipe down pat and it's working well, then I start to play around with it a bit, a little bit. How about if I try some of this, a little bit of that? How about if I do more kneading, less kneading? And sometimes they work out well, sometimes they're a flop, but that's where the engagement and experimentation comes in. It would be boring to follow the same bread recipe every time I go into the kitchen to make bread. Now, over the years, my colleagues and I have uh, gotten together with people that are using our model. Many of them come to our summer uh, Confortute program at the University of Connecticut. And I get them together in a small group and I ask them, what's working in your program? What's not working? How can you make it work? And I have, this is from a number of years of doing this. And I've tried to summarize it with what makes for an outstanding school-wide enrichment model program. And the first one is total faculty involvement. A lot of teachers of the gifted often feel like uh, they're kind of left out of things. They used to be included before they became the teacher of the gifted. Now all of a sudden, everybody says, oh, you got it easy. You don't know what we have to do. And I think that uh, one of the things we need to do is to let the rest of the faculty know that doing these things can be fun and engaging for the teacher if they're willing to try them out. So that's what we mean by total faculty involvement. Now, the first thing is knowledge about the model. And we've done a number of things over the years to make this as easy as possible. One of the things that we have is many, many articles on our website. Everything on our website at the University of Connecticut is downloadable, reproducible, translatable to, into other languages, free without permission, without charge. There are some books on it, obviously, but the other thing is that we've produced a, a series of videos. There is an online course, a free course online on the SEM. And Sally Reese and I have, have also developed seven short videos, which really cover a lot of the things that I have talked about in this discussion. And they're free and downloadable, and uh, you can find them online at uh, www.gifted.ucon.edu. Look for the, uh, in the school-wide enrichment model file, look for short videos. Um, the second thing is ownership. You build it your way. I never want to see two carbon copies of a school-wide enrichment model, because if that's the case, it will mean that the teachers haven't used their own imagination and creativity to develop the program so it really reflects what they're all about. Um, in fact, many of the ideas, you saw a few of them today, the poem, uh, uh, the average kind of hell, and other kinds of things have all come to me uh, from different teachers that we work with over the years. Common goals, the three E's, but unique means that you build it your way as long as you reach the three E's, that's the key. The only thing we require is that at the end of a given school year, if we were to survey your kids, we would get a lot of good feedback related to the three E's. Uh, there you see again uh, the common goals, which are the three E's, but you build it your way. You might have some people in your town that are outstanding uh, gardeners or outstanding uh, uh, weavers or, or in their hobbies, whatever resources you have at your disposal. 
The next thing is uh, work hard, work smarter, not harder. And again, uh, I'm not trying to sell Renzulli Learning. They're actually giving it away during the pandemic. You might get a free trial. But I do believe you can't do this kind of teaching without quick and easy access to all of the wonderful resources that the internet and all of the kinds of things that are out there in the world that never seem to make it into our very limited school textbooks. The next one is a teacher and administrator trust. My gang goes out and does a lot of workshops in schools on this model. And one of our requirements is that the principal comes and stays. Many principals have that gun at their head about getting the scores up on the state achievement test. And if they don't understand what we're trying to do, it will not last very long. And so uh, we even run a separate session for uh, administrators at our summer conference program. The next one is a celebration of excellence of student productivity. They know what the scores are for all the third graders in math in your district. They don't know some of the kinds of individual projects that you saw examples of today. And if I had a days rather than hours, I could give you, I have a whole file of all these great projects that have come from enrichment clusters and that have come from type three enrichment. And the last item there is a joyful school culture, what I call a radiation of excellence. These are the outcomes that we hope will result from doing these kinds of things. And so I think that uh, most of the time that we have these discussions, we see these things that have already emerged are in the process of emerging. Some of the people have said, we've got to go back and do a little bit more training with our teachers, especially the teachers that teach math and right answer subjects. Um, I have a wonderful example that I got from a teacher about uh, a math teacher uh, who was in, our, in that teacher's uh, training program. This was a GT teacher. And a uh, math teacher uh, came up with this activity, which I love. He asked the kids how much is six times four, and everybody answers 24. And then he says, Question number two, how many different ways can you make the number 24? And when I talked to this teacher when I was visiting the school, he said, you know, some of the kids that just know simple stuff, 23 plus one, 22 plus two, some of the kids use subtraction, some use both multiplication, subtraction and division. And I talked to a mathematician about this and he laughed at me, he said, Joe, there are an infinite number of ways to make 24. So the kids that were really advanced in math and knew much more about it and knew algebra and things like that, they were coming up with what they considered to be unique ways. This, this teacher actually had a contest. If you can come up with a way to make 24 that no one else will think of. So I think that uh, this really kind of summarizes a lot of our work over the last several decades really uh, at the University of Connecticut. We are in probably 30 countries around the world, uh, uh, places like China and Chile and, and uh, Lebanon and the Middle East and many European countries. I want to end by bringing up something that it recently just occurred and it's bothered me a great deal and it should also bother almost anybody in the gifted field. Uh, a report came out on April 19th called the Hechinger Report covering innovation and inequality in education. And this report was based on a research study that was presented at the American um, Educational Research Association meeting and will subsequently be produced as an article in a journal. And here's the headline of the Hechinger Report. Proof points gifted programs provide little to no academic boost, new study says. And basically what these researchers looked at were only achievement test scores. Uh, and what happened is a lot of news feeds picked this up. So this article comes from some news feed study, colon, gifted programs not beneficial. 
A study of 1,300 elementary students across the U.S. raises questions about whether gifted programs and zero outcomes of students. And of course, if they're only looking, remember that continuum of learning theories, deductive, didactic, if they're only looking at just kids' responses on standardized tests, well, basically, that's not what the main goal is. If we want to produce the next generation of creative, inventive, investigative scientists, artists, musicians, inventors, we've got to be able to let the public know what we stand for. Um, the person on the left is Wayne Gretzky, the world's greatest hockey player. And I love this quotation. A good hockey player always knows where the puck is. A great hockey player always knows where the tuck puck is going to be. And by the way, uh, I just did an article on this. You can get it uh, at that website uh, uh, there. The article's really gained a lot of attention. Uh, uh, and uh, I believe that we in gifted education have always been. We were on the front end of thinking skills. We were on the front end of problem-based learning. We have a sense for where the puck is going to be. And so I think that if you really want to make some changes in our program, I know change isn't easy, but bring out your creativity, your enjoyment and engagement in your profession, rather than always being at the bottom of the food chain and getting yet another unit, even if they put gifted on it in science, it's still another prescribed presented unit. I just ran across this cartoon, uh, this man, the hotel, He's getting his wake-up call in the morning. And the person says, this is your wake-up call, change or die. And I believe that this is what's going to happen. You saw places like New York and Cleveland and places like that that are getting rid of their programs because they can't address the underrepresentation problem. And remember, when I talk about underrepresentation, I am talking about kids that are like Ethan or middle-class kids or certainly not uh, low income or minority, but their talents and their interests have, have not been recognized. Uh, I love this quotation by uh, JFK, conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of research. If we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. So when t people talk about universal screening and, and uh, local norms and things like that, you're always using the same damn test that you've always used. Uh, I put new stuff that I'm working on uh, up on my uh, uh, LinkedIn account, if you're interested, uh, and it should pop up there. Whoops, there it is. Okay. Uh, if you want to uh, keep up with some of the work that my colleagues and I are doing at the University of Connecticut, you can just sign up for that and... Uh, uh, I send some old stuff out. Some, if an article becomes very popular, uh, my assessment for learning, for example, has gotten very popular. I'll put that up on the uh, LinkedIn account and uh, you're certainly welcome to access that. So uh, we end by saying uh, thank you in as many languages as I, as I could fit on the screen. Um, it, it, the change aspect of my work has what has kept me alive, has kept me enthusiastic about what I do uh, plus years in at the University of Connecticut and several years of teaching before that. And uh, I think that uh, the enjoyment part is really what is the most important part of all learning. So I thank you for listening and I am happy to receive your questions. And thank you, Sam, for all your work in getting this organized. So, so thank you, Professor Gensuri. Thank you for sharing as your advanced assessment tool, Gensuri uh, Learning System, uh, which uh, uh, not only uh, take advantage of the pioneer technology, uh, but also provide uh, uh, provide enjoyment, engagement, enthusiastic uh, atmosphere for the student to show your talent. So this uh, uh, system may help us to uh, solve the underrepresentation uh, problem of the standard uh, test uh, for low-income 
and the minority student. So uh, Professor Dan Suri is in now on, online. Uh, would you like to uh, add some more information to the audience? Or say a few words? And please uh, turn on your microphone. Uh, is that better? Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so we can hear you now. Thank you. Um, most of what I've done, the information is available, as I said, on our website. But if anyone has any uh, specific questions, if they will send them to me and uh, I'll be happy to try to answer them. I answer every email. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that it is a great honor for me to be with you. I hope that at a future Asian Pacific conference, I can be in your beautiful part of the world in person. I'd also like to send my greetings to my former student, dear friend and colleague, Denmo Sai. He was one of my grad students and went on to be one of the best known contributors and in the world for the work that he has done. So Denmo, if you're listening, I send you my very best wishes and uh, to your lovely wife and daughter as well. And of course, I was proud to have the opportunity over the years to work with Wu Jing Wu, and uh, he's made many great in contributions to the profession as well. So if there is time for questions, I would be happy to uh, try to answer them. Okay. We still have a little time to open the floor to one or two uh, questions or comments. If you have any question or comment, please raise your hand on site or online. <laughs> yeah, my dad. Online. Have you online? How to? I think there is one a person online who is going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, is that me? Yes, please. Is that me? Yes, oh. please. Um, hi, Professor Ranzuli. Thank you for that. I'm Marissa Pincus. I live in, in Melbourne in Australia. And I we teach an online gifted program that goes across state schools. Um, and I was thinking about the idea of, of trust in teachers um, in terms of formative and summative assessment. So for students to be part of our course, uh, there is uh, standardized testing that's used, but teachers can also nominate students to be part of it. And I guess I just find it very sad that teachers aren't trusted enough in terms of their professional knowledge to notice when there's something special about a child that wouldn't, as you said, show up in standardized testing. And how, how can we, I don't know, I guess this is beyond gifted teaching, but how can we improve that or better that? Well, um, you probably are aware that uh, over the years we have developed a number of teacher rating scales and I've also developed a teacher training activity to use those scales so that if the word like creativity is used or a word like uh, motivation is used that we're all relatively in agreement with the meaning of that because some teachers might think, oh, creativity, that's only people who are artists or, or musicians. Uh, and so uh, I think that any school that we work with, certainly we abide the laws in many states must use standardized tests, but we also try to insist that they also use uh, teacher ratings. And uh, I think that uh, teachers sensitive teachers can see things in young children. Uh, for example, you saw Ethan, a teacher, recommended that he take the enrichment cluster on, it's called, so you, would, so you want to be an inventor. She suggested that to him, and you saw the wonderful story 
uh, on his very short video. Uh, and I, I do believe that um, also the the more formative types of instruments that we use uh, in addition to the teacher rating scales, the interest -alizers, and I have a whole family of those for different age and grade levels. I even have one for people applying to our graduate program. I want to know what you're all about so I can tailor your program more to your needs. And um, I think that, um, yes, it does involve more paperwork. There are softer instruments, obviously, than tests. That's why we digitize them in Renzulli Learning. But at the same time, they tell us so much more about a young person that simply when we get a math or reading score, which is what standardized, most standardized tests are all about. And I think the more information we have about a student, the better able we are to make the kinds of uh, opportunities, resources, and encouragement that are going to allow them to do things such as you saw in the few examples that I used today. Thank you. Thank you. That, that really helps. And they're all online, all of us. We have some of them, but they're all online. Yeah, m m most of the instruments uh, are online at our website. And uh, if, if there's any particular ones that you're interested in, just send me an email and I'd be happy to send them to you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Marisa and uh, Professor Zensudi's answer. And, uh, and, uh, Professor Guo Tsai. Uh, Professor Ren Ruli, I'm Jin Zhi Guo from National Taiwan Normal University. I'm the organizer. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank you uh, very, very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much. Um, it, is, it is 10, I think 10.35 <laughs> in United States. You must be tired, but uh, we would like to say happy birthday to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. Oh. Let's all hands together and say happy birthday to, to Thank you. Professor and Zuli. Happy hey, hey, birthday hey. again. <laughs> yes, okay. thank you. Well, yesterday was my, my birthday, and uh, one of my students, I'm teaching a class this summer, one of my students said, uh, what is the one wish that you would like to make uh, when you blow out the candles on your birthday cake, which is an American tradition. And I said, my one wish is 87. Yeah. And on behalf of the Asia Pacific Federation on giftedness, I would like to say happy birthday again. Yeah, from all Thank of you us. Thank very much. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I I'm Usani Anurudwong. I've been uh, visit your center before. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. From Thailand. From Thailand. And now well, I'm the president of the. We're always, we're always happy to have visitors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now your student, Professor Demo Tsai, uh -huh. will say something to you. Happy birthday, my dear teacher. Hey, so good to you see you. <laughs> very good to see you. And uh, uh, really very grateful that uh, you are always uh, so, commit uh, so committed to support the gifted world. That's uh, great. Uh, to have you here in this speech. And uh, I just want to give uh, one comment. Uh, uh, during your uh, speech, you mentioned uh, work smarter, not work harder. I think during your speech, you really give us the information, the know-how, and uh, support all the resources that can support us to work smarter. So uh, your speech is very helpful and uh, very thankful for your commitment to this gifted world. So happy 
to see you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> well, I can only say I can only say one thing that the three E's enjoyment, engagement, and enthusiasm are for teachers and for me as they are for children. You know how and much I enjoy my work and that, that's why I'm still working that after my 80, 86th birthday. And so if we could get teachers to enjoy what they're doing by giving them opportunities to be creative, like the creative idea generator, then you're going to have teachers that do a better job with young people. Uh, hello, uh, Professor Ranzuri. I'm Wu Tian Wu from National Taiwan Normal University. Yes. I'm so happy to meet you again online. <laughs> and enjoy, enjoy very much your wonderful speech. Hopefully in the near future, you could come to Taiwan again. Happy birthday to well, you. I, I, would I would love to come and see you, especially in, in Denmo. And I hope that this uh, awful <laughs> pandemic will eventually allow uh, more of that. The two wonderful resources that have had an influence, not just in your country, but around the world. So congratulations to you two as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, uh, Goodbye, everybody. I Thank you, uh, thank, thank you, you Professor. You. Thank you Lee. for Professor Lin Sili again, and a happy birthday to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, as, right. as I think people have a lot of words to say to Lin Sili, but I, as the chair, I have, have to end this session. <laughs> <laughs> so, so okay. thank you again. I'm, si I'm so. signing off. Bye -bye. Goodbye.